Hey guys, welcome back to Retro Rivals. Uh, just want to let you know, I've been writing this review in my mind for a couple days now, and I had no intention on even doing one since social media has been so saturated with everything The Last of Us 2. But after watching my husband play through his first complete playthrough of the game, and then also following shortly behind with my own complete playthrough of the game, I had to do so for a couple of reasons. First off, the dark cloud of this game is so opaque that in all honesty, it might be therapeutic to express my thoughts and feelings. No matter if you love or hate this game, it can be best described as a lot. Almost important as the need for closure, it has become clear that at least some of the reviews floating around are being done by people who haven't even played the game or haven't completed it fully, cinematic cutscenes and all. The following game capture is all my own, and after investing over 60 plus hours of time into this game over the last three weeks, I can assure you that the effort is there and my thoughts and feelings are genuine and altogether my own. I expect this game will be dissected and discussed for years to come. Since its release not quite a month ago, I've been having a hard time to avoid reading any spoilers. I like to keep the experience authentically pure, and I'll tell you, it was near impossible, but I did it. As a result, I can't stress enough that if you are not wanting to see spoilers, please turn back. It would be impossible to do a comprehensive review without them, and I sincerely would never want to ruin the experience for you. I also encourage you to freely express your thoughts and feelings in the comment section below, but to do so in a respectable manner. We all have opinions, and that doesn't make them wrong or right. That just makes them our own. If you feel like what I have to say is inappropriate or wildly off the mark, then I challenge you to play through the game, write your own review, and do your own research. It's not as easy as you'd think. With all that out of the way, I think it's high time we sink our teeth into The Last of Us 2, pun intended, and see what all the media fuss is about. I think it goes without saying that The Last of Us 2 has been the most anticipated sequel of the decade. Unless you've been living in a bunker for the last seven years, or you're my mom and watch the channel to support retro rivals, but have no idea about video games, it's not a stretch to say that the pressure to appease the masses with an equally successful follow-up must have been a crushing task for the entire Naughty Dog team. Without giving too much away yet about my own thoughts, let's explore one area of the game that no one can deny is absolute perfection, and that's the graphics. Standing in a class of graphically amazing games like God of War, Spider-Man, and Death Stranding, the Last of Us 2 is the tall kid in the class picture that barely fits in the frame. From the background accuracy, as depicted by this YouTuber's side-by-side -side comparison, we see a current day Seattle and a ravaged, decaying, virally infected Seattle, and the likeness is uncanny. If attention to detail is something you appreciate, then pay attention to all the main and supporting characters in this game. I was amazed by the ability to convey all the emotions someone would have normally through digital means. We have come a long way in the almost 50 years since people would lose their mind over being able to hit a ball with two moving paddles. Kudos to the face models and voice actors who lent their likeness and vocals to this game, as you can have the best graphics in the business, but if you have a monotone, facially dead fish emoting these characters, the game would be a travesty. It was all the little details that really had me in awe. We noticed that more often than not, when one of the characters would be carrying a melee weapon from one player-driven scene, then in a story-driven cutscene, it would be the same. I found very few glitches in the game, but did happen to run into a few. I don't know about you guys, but I actually really enjoy finding these in small quantities. It feels like your own personal Easter egg, and if you can capture them and share them with others, it's good for a laugh. While they didn't impact the game greatly, there were a few bugs that caused me to have to save the game and reload it from the last save point, and that always solved the problem. A slight inconvenience, but certainly not life ruining, throw your controller in a white hot rage, <coughs> days gone. The music was spot on for the feel of the game and was reminiscent of the first one. I've encountered a few reviewers that said there could have been more musical interludes, but for me, it was neither here nor there. 
I didn't find there was any dead space, but for the bulk of the game, I was pretty immersed and was more focused on breaking down the story and getting through the heavy, long combat scenes. And I guess while we're on the topic of that, gameplay was another A++. It was so smooth and fluid, and the accessibility options gave everyone the ability to play. I'm so happy we're moving in a direction that games are not just being made for one specific class of gamer, but for gamers of all limitations, abilities, and skill levels. I don't at all mean that in a derogatory way when I say limitations, so please don't take it that way. I am happy that we are in an era that we can appreciate the needs of everyone and make a game for everyone. There are also options for the elitist gamers who can run circles around me. I choose to play on light mode, but the options go from very light to survival. I am no survival mode gamer, and props to those that can play in that mode and make it look easy. If you want an extra challenge, you can even turn off the HUD and make it more like playing a real life scenario. Well, as real as it can get playing a video game. I've just rambled on for three pages. Yes. I script everything in advance, and we haven't even actually touched the story yet. The bulk of the game is set five years later over three days in Seattle. With cutscenes and flashbacks to times in between and a year or so in the future, Ellie and Joel have put down roots in Jackson. While things seem to be back to a normal way of life, there is obvious tension that remains. Carried through from the last game, emotions as well as physical tensions fester. Ellie still harbors resentment towards Joel for taking away her right to choose to be the cure this decimated world desperately needs. She wanted her life to matter, and she is struggling to find her place. For anyone that said Ellie's character seemed bland or hard to play, consider the points I mentioned above. You wouldn't have a traumatized character frolicking through a field of daisies, but Ellie does have happy interludes. They are just not as often and abundant as in the first game. Everything done in this game is purposeful, whether you like it or not. There were definite moments I didn't enjoy. Playing the guitar, why? Why is this part of the game mechanics? But play through and you'll understand. It didn't make me like it more, but I appreciated the reason and we will cover that in a bit. Physically, even though they live in a compound in Jackson, safely tucked away, growing in numbers and reestablishing civilization, the physical threats are still a reminder that life is not back to quote unquote normal. New foes and new monsters make for dangerous times. And I promised spoilers and guess what peeps, we've arrived. So don't say I didn't warn you twice. Enter Abby. You'll get to play as her for a short stint. It's confusing at first as to what the purpose is of this new character. Maybe letting us learn the controls, getting a feel for the game and gameplay, and then we run into Joel. Aha, ever the savior, leading Abby out of a sticky situation that would have cost her her life. And then she betrays Joel and does this. Joel, get up. Joel, fucking get up. Please stop. Please don't shoot. Joel, please get up. <laughs> Well, we saw it coming, right? I've heard this was leaked, but I could only speculate until I played for myself that this was going to happen. I vehemently avoided all topics containing The Last of Us 2 and read nothing leading up to the release. Like when Sarah died in the first installment, but perhaps a million times harder, nothing could have prepared us for this ending of one of the most beloved video game characters of all time. No one wanted to see Joel die, me included. However, I'd rather an epic death of a warrior and have him go out like a champ than fade into the abyss and die of cancer or a singular infected bite. And went out like a champ he did, shot in the knee, delivering the best one-liner in the entire game. You act like you heard of us or something. Because they have. Say whatever speech you got rehearsed. Get this over with. As someone who used to be a die-hard devoted Walking Dead fan, it was common practice for the most beloved characters to be killed in the most gruesome ways to pay homage to their on-screen contribution. Perhaps this was Naughty Dog's way of honoring Joel, 
and also of steering the story in a different direction. We all love the first game, but you can't make the same game twice and not feel a little let down or tricked into having been served the same perfect dish and calling it a second course. Can you top trying to find a cure? It's the catalyst for all great virus stories. We were promised something different of equal or greater value. And were we? That's all a question we have to give thought to and answer for ourselves. For those that moaned about how unfair it was that Abby tortured Joel and that Joel would never do that, did you even play the game? There's a cutscene in Seattle with Ellie and Dina where they find two dead hostages tied to chairs. Tommy has gone ahead to seek his revenge on Abby and Ellie and Dina are following closely behind in his wake. It is clear to Ellie that this is the work of Tommy. She talks about how he and Joel would often use two comrades against each other and interrogate them for information and to make sure facts from each lined up. While maybe not as gruesome as physical torture, can you imagine the mental torture of having to turn against a friend to save your own life? Watching your friend die and then ultimately die anyways? That your last deed done on this earth was betraying a friend and watching them killed before your very eyes. I'm not trying to demonize Joel's character, but I think social etiquette and humane justice in a post-apocalyptic world is fantasy. You do what you need to survive, and you carry the burden you can shoulder, which won't be the same for every individual. Emphasis on individual. Carrying on through Ellie's portion of the story, we spend three days in Seattle trying to catch up to Tommy and trying to find Abby and everyone involved in Joel's death. We seek refuge in an old theater, and it works out as mostly a safe space where Dina and Ellie are able to hide out. My favorite line from Dina comes during this portion. I think I'm pregnant. <laughs> what? Don't worry, it's not yours. <laughs> The humorous and light moments are not as prevalent in this game, so you take what you can get. It is an emotionally heavy game. It is also a combat and scavenge heavy game. I mention this because it has been a common point of contention for some people, but I personally thought it gave the game flow, peaks as well as valleys. This is where my husband and I have opposite viewpoints. He hated long scavenging periods and wanted to keep fighting. He's not much of a stealth player and missed the action. While I enjoyed both, I'm more of a lurk in the shadows, sneak up behind you and stab you in the throat sort of player. So when we entered a scavenge portion, my heart rate had time to return to normal. Some new enemies were introduced as well as new play options, weapons, weapon upgrades and skill trees. Shambler, Stalkers, and the Rat King on the infected side, and WLF, or Wolf, Seraphites, or Scars, and Rattlers. In addition to the human enemies in the Wolves and the Rattlers, they also have dogs trained to sniff out an enemy's location and neutralize them. My absolute least favorite enemies were Stalkers and Dogs. They took away your ability to be stealth. You can't attack a stalker since their whole purpose is in their name, to stalk you. Dogs will sniff out your trail, so really by the time you can detect them, they've already started hunting you down. They also give away your location to everyone around you and are simply a nuisance. My favorite way to devastate a shambler also had my husband and I at odds. He enjoys up close and personal combat, and that's not advisable with a shambler, much like a bloater. This brings me to one of my new favorite weapons of the game, trap mines. On to a little math lesson. Two trap mines equal one dead shambler. So if you have two shamblers, which happens in a few spots in the game, my strategy was always to take out the runner stealthy, as well as clickers if I could get to them without being spotted. Leave shamblers to the last, lay down trap mines in various locations, and then call attention to your location with a well-placed breaking of a bottle or shooting in their direction. This was so effective, it was my favorite method of mayhem. I also found a new love for using the bow that I really didn't use in the first game, but I liked the crossbow even more as you could add a scope attachment, making it that much more accurate and in turn, deadly. 
On the human side, I hated the scars most of the time. And my husband and I affectionately referred to them as park people since we first encountered them in the park. They were also just batshit crazy and the ultimate epitome of occult religion turned violent. However, the park people did have some appeal. Since most of them used melee weapons, that big damn hammer was the best thing of life as long as you weren't on the receiving end. Since I'm a stealth player, you can best believe I spent a great portion of the game crawling around in a prone position, as well as shooting and attacking in this position. I also sincerely appreciated that Ellie could use her knife to kill clickers and no longer needed shivs. I did miss shiving open doors to find an abundance of useful treasures, but the workaround to that was encountering a locked door that you'd have to find an alternate route to opening. You could also get into a building by smashing the glass, and another neat trick was that if you didn't know the code to a safe, you could actually listen for a deeper click to know you were on the right number. Which, honestly, weren't that hard to find, but my favorite one was the one written on the bathroom. And if you haven't seen that yet, it's great. For a good time call, and there's your code. The skill tree and weapon upgrades were a bit more intricate this time around, but I liked it. It gave more options to customize your playstyle, which was a neat added feature that could have gotten overwhelming, but was done so perfectly that it was just complex enough without teetering into overworked. So while we spent most of our time in Seattle and the odd flashback from Ellie's past, which was nice since they all involved Joel and we all needed a little bit more Joel, we need to talk about the second half of the game, better known as Abby's half. When Ellie comes back to her hideout and the cutscene with Jesse's death happens, as well as Tommy being shot, my first thought was, where is Dina? Since Ellie so violently killed a pregnant Mel, and more importantly, Owen, would Abby just as easily kill Dina for the same reason? Or would she have had time to even say anything? Was she killed immediately on sight off scene? My thoughts were swirling. When the game switched over and we started playing as Abby, I'll admit, I was not impressed. My exact words to my husband were, we better not have to play as Abby for three days. And as we continued playing and got past her prologue and I saw Seattle day one flash up on the screen, I broke my cardinal rule of not looking up spoilers, but only enough to Google, how long do you play as Abby? The answer, approximately 12 hours. That's it, I'm done. I told my husband, I'll watch you finish the game, but I don't know if I wanna play a second half of the game as Abby. It should have ended at the theater. I felt like this for a good couple hours, often excusing myself from the game room to do anything else or play around on my phone. Here's where I think most reviewers finished the game and filled in the rest with what they read online. And I'll tell you, if you did, you missed out. I guess it's okay to say at this point that while the story did have a few flaws, overall, I really, really enjoyed it. If I could change some things, I'd have to agree with the majority of reviewers that sending Mel out was probably reckless, but it was necessary to punctuate the awkwardness between her and Abby. The entire sex scene with Abby and Owen was over the top and bordered on violent, but expressed this cardinal desire they still had for each other, even though it was certainly a forbidden act given Owen's current relationship status. At first, I was extremely disturbed that the game kept trying to make me like Abby. I would find myself saying, I will never like her, or at the very least, if the game makes me choose in the end who to save, it will always be Ellie. I think the turning point for me on Abby's character is when she runs into Manny on the docks and they're trying to disarm the shooter so that Abby can secure a boat. When I found out that I was rooting for Abby against Tommy, I literally felt sick to my stomach. All this time, I just wanted the shooter to die because of my compulsive tunnel vision-like desire to get to the Seraphite Island with Yara and rescue Lev. Okay, ugh, I take that back. Even before this happened, I was starting to warm to the idea of Abby and I started to get into her story. I felt like a traitor and though I still wanted Ellie to win, for lack of a better word, you feel powerful playing as Abby, 
You feel good rescuing this innocent soul in Lev that has been dealt such a raw deal in life. It is exhilarating and terrifying making your way from the marina to the hospital, encountering many enemies and testing Abby's ability to overcome her greatest fear, heights. This is a common thread in Abby's story, both in the present day gameplay and in flashbacks. I like this addition to the story, since you don't expect such a strong physical character to have a perceived weakness. And hate me if you want, but overall, Abby's side of the story was more fun to play. It had the most diversity and the best monster, the Rat King. I kid you not, it took me a solid half hour to will myself to press the triangle button on the med kit in the ambulance. Like I said, I watched my husband play first while trailing only slightly behind him with my own playthrough. Most of the time the secondhand experience was helpful. But in the instance of the Rat King, the more you know only preyed on my fears infinitely. All told, I died only once since I had the great advantage of knowing what to do. It just didn't feel like it at the time. The Seraphite Village was also very interesting, and traveling through Haven engulfed in flames was like no play experience I had ever had before. Also, swimming around like Jaws, lurking around in shallow water ready to pounce was epic. As the bodies piled up and the blood pooled around me, turning the flood a crimson red was just about the best combat scene in the entire game. And you cannot forget the last encounter with a Seraphite enemy. It was grotesque and stomach churning and visually stunning, even while I smashed the square button through squinted eyes. After that, a lot of cutscenes, a lot. Too many? Again, open to interpretation. The first time around I kept saying, okay, this is the end. Then I regurgitated the same statement over and over again from the next couple hours. Abby and Ellie fight at the theater, and Abby has Ellie and Dina dead to rights, but lets them go. That's gotta be the end. Nope. Dina has the baby. They're back on the outskirts of the compound in Jackson. Life seems peaceful for the most part. That's gotta be the end. Nope. Tommy comes to tell Ellie he has found information on Abby's whereabouts and wants her to do what she promised and finish Abby once and for all. But she says no. That's gotta be the end. Nope. Back and forth, back and forth. Abby's story in Santa Barbara, Ellie's in Jackson, like volleying in a tennis match. We won't go into too much detail about all of this, but we will talk about the final scene. So let's set it up. I'll preface by saying this. Joel's death was a very controversial scene. This one's up there too. We find ourselves as Ellie at the last known location that Abby was seen, the Rattler's prisoner camp, winding her way through the guards as best she can. She is malnourished from her trip and under strain from a torso wound earlier in this final sequence. Following the tracks towards a round building, that's where you'll find Abby. Thanks dude, bullet to the head. Well, that's what I assumed anyways. I'll just say this, while in the prisoner camp, let the runner and the clicker go and let that whole situation sort out itself. When you do finally make your way to the cells, Abby is nowhere to be found, but a thankful prisoner out of the group you have just set free tips you off to the fact that Abby tried to escape and is being held captive on the pillars. Abby is a shell of her former self, no muscle tone left, hair cut, barely alive, and extremely weak. Ellie is no better at this point, Barely putting one foot in front of the other, and from the loss of blood, sleep, and nourishment, I can only assume is in a near fugue state. After Ellie releases Abby, she cuts down Lev from his pillar and tells Ellie to follow her to safety where they can escape by boat. She snaps out of it when she puts her backpack in her own separate boat and has a flashback of Joel being tortured and her real reason for coming to find Abby. Revenge. This scene was one of my favorites in the whole game. Ellie could never win against Abby on a level playing field. To think differently is delusional, but in this reality, we see that Ellie is fueled by her rage and Abby has very little left but wanting to protect Lev. Even though I'm sure the need to protect Lev is great, I don't think it can mimic the adrenaline dump Ellie is feeling from finally finding Abby and fighting her way through to get to this very moment in time.
The final fight is brutal and harsh and nerve wracking. And then Abby does this. <laughs> And I cringe. Not the first time Abby has resorted to biting as a means of defense. As Ellie chokes Abby, holding her under the water, every part of me is screaming, don't do it. Don't do it. And I'll explain why. I don't think that ending would have been a win for Ellie. Rather, she wins by letting go of the ghost, and she does. I also selfishly want a part three, and I'm okay with the fact that it might be Abby's story, but who knows what Naughty Dog has in store. The first time I watched the ending, I felt so bad for Ellie. She has lost everything. She has lost Joel, Dina and the baby, and her connection with Jackson. With two fingers missing on her hand, she can't even execute the one thread that ties her to Joel, and that's playing the guitar. Joel taught her how to play, and now that ability is gone, a legacy she hoped to pass on to JJ. Now, if you're feeling as heartbroken as I am, some new information came to light that might help you feel not so devastated by this ending. So yes, we do see that in the end scene, Ellie agrees to try to forgive Joel prior, of course, to his death, but that doesn't help with her current situation of being utterly and completely alone. However, a keen observer has pointed out that when Ellie left, she was not wearing the bracelet Dina gave her in Seattle as a good luck charm, but in the present day end scene, she is. We were so focused on the missing fingers, we missed this. Much like when we focused on the pool of blood spilling from Mel, but not the map that Abby used to find Ellie, and we assume Tommy's headshot is fatal, when in actuality it grazes the side of his head. Like I said, anyone that played this game and didn't really open themselves up to the experience and immerse themselves would miss a lot, and that is just a few. To speculate, this may indicate that Ellie only returned for a visit to say goodbye, and is indeed in Jackson with Dina and the baby to be closer to everyone, as well as Jesse's family, aka JJ's grandparents. Hard to say, but that definitely paints a better picture, and gives the game a little bit more hope and closure. Okay, as a final thought to my gameplay, I couldn't skip this next issue for many reasons. A small part of me considered it, because I am nowhere known for my political views or prowess on such topics. I pride myself on my acceptance of anyone's beliefs, sexual orientation, race, etc. This world is massive. But here we are, in the year 2020, playing a video game, having a hissy fit over a perceived political agenda. It's only one, if you make it one. To me, it's just a story that starts out with a romantic relationship of two characters. They just happen to both be women. Have you played Uncharted? Another fabulous Naughty Dog title. Nathan Drake is never without a piece of arm candy. He could probably be described as a womanizer, but it's a game, guys. It's a goddamn game. As well, Lev just happens to be transgender, and it plays a pivotal part in the unraveling of the second part of the game. And I'm here to tell you that The Last of Us 2 didn't create these concepts. So why in the actual hell are people who worked on this game in any capacity getting death threats is beyond me. If you step outside your little protective bubble, there are all different sorts of people that exist. Big or small, black or white, gay or straight, so take your little pink panties out of a bunch. I'll tell you what I tell my son when he's being foolish, narrow-minded, and doesn't like the direction of something that is completely reasonable. That sounds like a you problem. So I get it. I know that in the beginning I asked for people to keep the comments clean and reasonable, but hear me out. If you have hatred in your heart for hatred's sake, I expect I never would have gotten through to you. So, this portion of the review, that was for you. Okay guys, that end got a little real and I couldn't help it. After seeing all the media hype about this game and people who worked on it, voice actors, models, uh, anybody that worked on developing the game, it, they're getting death threats they're being called the most 
derogatory names that you can imagine. And I'm just like, do people not realize this is a video game? It's a video game! Oh my god! It's, it's so crazy to think people are taking something so intense, something that is just tons and tons of pixels and losing their minds. Just, just losing their shit over a video game. So I had to address that. I'm a nobody, basically, in the YouTube world. I have a small following. Really, if I had a big following, it wouldn't matter. These things are all things that need to be said. That aside, I thought the game was brilliant. I don't care about anything else. I played the game, I loved it, and it was just a great game. So, you know what? For anybody that just can speak on the gameplay and just didn't like it, no, you know, no political agenda, just didn't care for it. That is completely reasonable because we are all allowed to like things. We're all allowed to hate things, but we shouldn't be ignorant. So, anyhow, I hope you guys liked my review. Um, if I was to give this game a grade, it is as close to a 10 out of 10 gets. Did I like it more than the first one? Yeah, I think I did. I think I really, really did. It is a fantastic game. And uh, if you feel so inclined, <laughs> you can like, subscribe, comment, ring the notification bell, 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 bell. Uh, yeah, let me know what you think. And uh, until next time, uh, I'll, I'll try not to be so controversial next time. Yeah, until next time. Game on.